I would rather die a virgin than you know harm a child or do anything that's gonna hurt anybody. Never offended. Right. Never. You're not on the registry. Right. Nothing on your record. Nothing on my record. I don't. I've never been. I've never. I mean, I've got speeding tickets. That's the biggest issue. Is not the sexual part of it. It's the emotional part of it. It's the part where, like, if I get to know a child, I fall in love with them, and then, as you can imagine, that you can't. There's nothing you can do with that. It's not yeah. like a with an adult you know it's you you can never reconcile it have you fallen in love with a child before i have hey i'm andrew hales welcome to another edition of chatting with today i'm here with todd hello <laughs> <laughs> what happened to your arm um okay so it was a congenital birth defect so i All was right. born without it virtuous pedophile mm -hmm. when did you figure out that you were attracted to kids the first inkling that I got of it was really in sixth grade. Um, I can remember sitting around a desk with some of my friends and for some reason there was nobody else in the classroom. We were working on a project. And you know as boys that age do the the subject of uh, you know which girl in class was attractive came up. Mm -hmm. And all of the other boys basically agreed that there's this one girl who was the most developed girl in the classroom was the most attractive and I kind of I didn't say anything because the girl I was I liked was the least developed girl in the class so I thought wait a minute I'm the odd guy out here I'm gonna I'm yeah. not gonna say anything and uh, and then so it was kind of like well I was attracted to this girl in, in the class who you know who was um, who was petite and not you know very well developed but I didn't really think a whole lot about it at the time you yeah, know we yeah. were both the same age but then about a year later um, I was in seventh grade and I can remember a, uh, a, um, neighbor came to visit. I was living, I was staying at my grandparents' house at the time and a neighbor came to visit my grandfather with, uh, his, um, seven-year-old daughter. And I can remember her walking into the room that was adjacent to the living room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked up at her and I just was like mesmerized by her beauty. Hmm. And that's kind of when I first started to realize, wait a minute my attractions go way lower than what I thought it, they did. I went through a few, like a couple of years of denial and kind of back and forth on it, but eventually, I, probably about the age of 16, I, I basically started to accept it. You never liked normal girls your age? Not really. Um, I had uh, a chance to, of course, I, you know, I, I was a pretty much a loner in high school anyway and kind of a you know recluse even then <laughs> like even yeah you know i really am right now i'm i'm definitely like not a very outgoing type of person but um yeah. but even then i was more you know an introvert and i stayed home a lot and i didn't really date i didn't do anything until i was out of high school so my first my actually my very first date so i was 18 and uh it was, you know, a, the, the, a, like a niece of a friend of my parents or something like that. We went to a Halloween party. She got drunk. We came back to my house, mm -hmm. made out a little bit, and then I kind of realized this isn't working. Hmm. You know, they just was, weren't into it. Yeah, it just was. There was just no chemistry there. Well, that's so, normal. Did you try a different girl? Um, I, I, I did, <laughs> actually did. Um, yeah. And here's the here's the interesting thing. Um, because that girl, she was, um, you know, uh, what I would call pretty well developed for her age. By the time I was 20, uh, this girl, I was working at Walmart, at, or I mean uh, Kmart at the time, and I was working checkout, and this girl came through my line, and uh, I mm -hmm. was 20, and she asked me out, and she, she actually was six years older than me, which is interesting. She was 26, but she was um, very petite, very small, so she kind of had the the body structure and I thought well maybe this will work hmm. but we dated for three weeks and um, you know I, I I was really really uh, I don't know what the you know like I was hesitant to have any sort of sexual relation w with her because I just didn't know if it was gonna work you, just, and, you still weren't aroused right and uh, she was one of those girls that um, you know, this was like the tail end of the 80s, early, or uh, no, it was early 90s. It was early 90s. So um, she was, it was, you know, that still the big hair and the, you know, mm -hmm. that look. And I, that's not a, that's a, not a good look for me. Like I, I you know. Sure. So um, 
I, um, yeah, so about the time we finally, you know, decided to tr try something, um, it, it didn't, it didn't work as I expected it wouldn't. And that was pretty much the end of it. I, fi I figured at that point, uh, this is not going to work because, you know, I, basically at that, at that time, I started to realize that, um, any girl that was post pubescent, you know, I had no, no attraction to or very little attraction to. When did you first come out? Um, again, it was kind of a gradual process. I, the first person I ever came out to was a high school friend of mine mm -hmm. and, uh, he was a gay, he was a gay friend of mine. And so I kind of felt, felt like, you know, he would understand it, you know, if anybody did. And this was back in the nineties, um, or well, it'd have been late eighties, early. Yeah. Like 89, 90, somewhere in there. Okay. But I graduated in 91. So it was right before I graduated. He reacted about like I expected he, he would. He was, he was very accepting. Okay. Um, because, and I, you know, and I told him, you know, yeah, I have the attraction, but I, you know, I don't, I would, I don't want to act on it. I don't want to do anything with it. So, you know, Okay. And uh, like I said, he was pretty accepting. Then um, the probably the next person that I came out to was my sister, and I did that through a letter. And she was it was a lot harder. Yeah. Because it, basically that was a confession to the whole family, right? I mean, I told my sister. Okay. Knew she was going to tell the rest of the family, and it was kind of my way of um, telling you know, everyone, telling everybody in the family, and. It went about as I expected it was going to go, which was uh, a whole lot of denial, a yeah. whole lot of people kind of, you know, like I, I got into some arguments with my mom over it. Um, and uh, even today, it's like, you know, I have members of my family that don't, that can't accept it. They don't deal with it. But I do ha also have a lot of support from my family. So, But you do want to be public about it for, for what reason? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, for one thing, you know, anybody who's ever had a kind of a dark secret like this can yeah. probably tell you that that's kind of, uh, that kind of thing is can be hard to live with. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll say basically. Yeah, because you're basically presenting a false front, a false face to, to society. It's kind of like lying. Yeah. You know, and if, you know, for me, I like, I've always been one of those people that I don't like lying even to myself, you know, and, and I'm just, I'm not good at it, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know how I got, you know, the, the only way that I think, you know, people didn't figure it out sooner is that like, you know, they didn't want to, it was one of those things where mm. people, you know, I think my, my friends and family just didn't want to see it, but the signs were there, you know. Huh. Um, I think. Wait, I mean, what, what kind of signs? Like, you know, for example, like some of the artwork that I um, did was, you know, although always about little, you know, those little girls or, um, you know, usually like in fantasy things like fairies, I did that. All right. And I would collect, you know, I had art on my walls, like, you know, little fairy girls and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, huh. uh, you know, and I, I and clearly wasn't gay. So, you know, sure. I, I don't know. To me, that's kind of like, and, and the other thing is, you know, being that I was um, very uh, kind of awkward around most adults at that time but like i could be around kids and it, it was you know i i just was natural with them yeah and like, even my mom commented one time that you know i was over at a friend's house and of, the, of the, a friends of theirs and um i was just kind of sitting there just to myself and a, their uh son or daughter or whatever came over and they had their their granddaughter with them who was I, I think about eight or nine Hmm. And mom, my mom said to her friend, see how he lights up when a kid comes in the room, you know, because hmm. it's just like that's I just responded to that. Right. To, I don't know. It's it's there's something there's something to uh, to map, uh, uh, you know, sexuality or whatever. That's um, this is one of the things people misunderstand. They think that, that it's all like one dimensional. Right. You know, that it's just all purely sexual. It's not. Um it's like anybody there's a um there's like an emotional component to it 
a lot of times, you know, for me, like the bigger, the in fact, the biggest issue is not the sexual part of it. It's the emotional part of it. It's the part where, like, if I get to know a child, I fall in love with them. And then, as you can imagine, that you can't, there's nothing you can do with that. It's not yeah. like a with an adult, you know, it's, you, you can never reconcile it. Have you fallen in love with a child before? I have. It Was it a, like a niece or? or? No, well, no, it was a um, young girl that uh, was a, was the daughter of friends of my parents. Okay. And you, you're okay having that on camera? Mm. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, obviously nothing, nothing came of it. It's not, right, you know, that's. Right. It, 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 but I'm saying that's for, I think for a lot of maps, that is the hard part of dealing with this because, you know, people go, oh, you can't, you know, you have a hard time controlling yourself. You're going to, you know, you're destined to offend. I don't think that's true for most maps. I think most maps can control their sexuality just fine. It's not really, it's like anybody, you know, Hold it's on, like map, map, minor attractive person. We usually, oh. we usually go by, some of us go by that. Um, some of us go, you know, verb ped, ethical, yeah, um, ethical ped or whatever. Uh, yeah. Okay. Political activists. What mm -hmm. are, what are some of the goals and that you're trying to accomplish? Oh, okay. Well, this yeah. kind of ties back to yeah the reason why I'm out. Right. Um. For the first and foremost, I want um, young maps to understand, you know, that they're not doomed to offend. That's a not. That's nonsense. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, I fear that a lot of times kids that are dealing with a sexuality, that becomes self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, for them. Like they internalize that message and, you know, well, I'm dumb destined to offend anyway. So, you know, whatever, like mm -hmm. that's not true. So I want to, and also just to, just to give them support because, you know, I know, I can remember what it was like being. 16, 17, 18, dealing with that sexuality and not having anybody to turn to and not having anybody I could talk about it with it, you know? And uh, so I'm, I'm, and the other part of it is, is that I want to show society, yes, non-offending maps exist. We are out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, most of us are, you know, they they don't want to come out because they either they have families or, uh, you know, for some reason it, it jeopardizes their job or whatever, you know. Um, so okay. they, because of the stigma, most not, no maps are afraid to come out. Did, your, did you ever try to make it go away? Or I don't know, just try to... Yeah, yeah. Um, I've tried to, um, especially... Um, during my college years, because right before I graduated college in 2003, I, I was like, I kind of went to college late. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't start going until I was 25, and I graduated when I was about 30. Mm -hmm. And so the f last couple of years of college, I was in a really, really weird place. Um, I was um, smoking a lot of weed. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of trying to change who I was, you know, and because I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm down to the wire now and I'm about to go out into the world and have to be a professional and do all this stuff. I need to get serious about this and try to, you know, change my sexuality or at least um, make it where I can live with somebody, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I tried to do that. Yeah. And uh, it backfired horribly. Um because basically, you know, I was trying, I was like, you know, th trying to, uh, I, the comparison that I usually you're trying to use, force it, yeah. yeah, you're forcing it. And it's kind of like taking a rubber band and pulling it, pulling it, pulling it. And eventually that rubber band is going to snap, right? Mm. I mean, you can only pull it so far. If it, 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 you, sexuality is, is something that's, you know, part of your nature you, you just can't it's you can't it doesn't work that way i would i would rather die a virgin than you know harm a child or do anything that's gonna hurt anybody and uh and i also you know i'm i'm in a way i'm like i'm like i said i'm modeling that it's possible for maps to live a celibate life it's it's entirely possible it's not easy Mm. Um, it comes with all sorts of complications. I mean, um, you know, there's, you know, uh, 
the, the main one being just dealing with the loneliness of it, mm -hmm. you know, not having a, like, cause, you know, most people they have, gay or straight, you know, you have somebody you can talk to every day that's your partner that you can, you know. Right. And, and, and you know, me, I live alone. Mm -hmm. But I've lived that way for a long time and I'm kind of used to it now. Yeah. So, uh, um, so you, you mentioned in the Barb Cross video that uh, you were abused, you were fondled for a second when you were 11 or something? Seven. Seven. Yeah. And then you said <clears throat> that there might have been some other contributing factors. Yeah. Like what else, what were those factors? Okay, so um, my theory on the development of sexualities, um, at least like, I feel like, um, you know, there is a genetic component that probably pushes people one way or another, but it doesn't basic. it's, it's not the overall determining factor. Mm -hmm. Like it might push somebody, like it's a, you know, um, there may be like, you know, the the standard default, uh, you know, heterotelio normative sexuality mm -hmm. for more for most people. There may be genetic mutations that kind of push people in other directions. But I believe that really it's a combination of uh, genetics and environment that create somebody's sexuality. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that just because you somebody was sexually molested, that necessarily means they're going to be a pedophile. Obviously, that happens all the time, and not everybody who it happens to becomes mm -hmm. a pedophile. But some people do. It's higher than the average of people who aren't. Okay. So that suggests to me that it's a factor, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's the only factor. I think what happens, in, in in my case, like what happened is I ended up kind of identifying with my abuser in a way because um, with... I can remember being 11 years old and sitting there in, a, in the back of my dad's Jeep. He had a Jeep at, a at the time. He was driving and he had a, a friend in the passenger seat. And the, the story came over the radio about um, like a local child who, who had been sexually abused. Like, I could, you know, they didn't, there wasn't a lot of details. I mean, it was a news story. Mm -hmm. And I can remember my dad saying to his friend something like, they should take people like that and put weights on their testicles till they're crushed. Hmm. And uh, I was horrified by that because uh, I was like, well, you know, my dad did not know. He, I, as far as I know, I don't think he was aware at that time of my own abuse because I hadn't really talked about it. Hmm. Um, I, the only person that really knew, uh, as far as I know, was my grandmother because she was the only one that I had told up till that point. Um, but anyway... Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, where was I? Uh, uh, so yeah, in the car with your dad. Yeah, and he yeah, says yeah. That, yeah. And he says that, and and uh, and I'm sitting there going, you know, I've, I'm filtering it through my own experience, and I can remember uh, I kind of liked my abuser, even though he touched me. You know, it was he didn't hurt me. Uh, it was just touching. Yeah. And uh, you know, I mean, it was a little weird. It was something where I went, okay, well, that's unusual. You know, that's not something that usually happens. But at the same time, I didn't really make much of it at the time, and I kind of feel like maybe if uh, certain things didn't happen that I might have been able to get past that. Hmm. But I think because of certain events that happened afterward that kind of like pulled me back towards it and it kind of made me sort of obsess about it hmm. in a way. Um, and I don't think those kind of experiences are the same for everybody. I, I do think that, you know, um, you know, there's probably, like, for some, for some maps, I know they had a very, very sexual childhood. Like, they, um, they were sexual with a lot of other kids. Hmm. And so, I mean, um, you know, that might be a factor. Uh, some of them were actually, like, way more severely abused than I was. And they still ended up a map. So, I don't know. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say... You know, it's one thing or the other. I think it's really a combination of factors that right. make people. Rehabilitation for his. Yeah, are are they asking if I've had counseling? Yeah. Yeah, I've. I'm actually in counseling now. In fact, I had a counseling session yesterday, or well, I was supposed to. Okay. It got canceled, but mm. um, I did see my nurse. So I got my meds. <laughs> how long? But, have you, how long have you been going to counseling? Uh, this this last time since um. January of this year, so almost a full year. Are they trying to 
like correct your orientation or no they don't they don't do that they can't do that anyway they know they can't do that it's um what they do is they just provide support um you know and i was there mainly for depression anyway so um well that's okay sorry what what were you saying yeah there's no they don't like there's this misconception yeah sorry let's (laughs) pause for a sec it's fine oh that's fine my back yeah Okay, yeah. Is it a mi- yeah? It's a misconception. There's a misconception that maps who go into counseling like they can be cured, like you know, like somehow they expect counselors to like change. There's like, and and a lot of that comes down to this idea that they believe that uh, pedophilia is not really a sexuality. Every in- there's every indicator that it is. Like you, if you, um, if you, if you parse out what a sexuality is, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of a up in the air question still, like a lot of people that haven't really kind of decided exactly what it is. But for me, the signs are, you know, it starts young, Mm -hmm. you know, usually around puberty, if not before. Um, It's, uh, you know, there's the emotional component to it. So it's not just purely sexual. There's like, there's characteristics. You can figure out what a sexuality is. It ticks off all the boxes. Okay. And I don't think that, um, you know, I don't believe in conversion therapy, either for gays or for pedophiles. I don't think that, it, I don't think it works. And it, it, it ends up doing, more, it would end up doing more harm than good. So um, the best they can do is um, help us to cope and find ways to live with it without causing harm. Well, there's, a, there's about five or six different core reasons why not in maps abuse kids. And percentage wise, uh, th- that offense uh, is like something like uh, 70%. So r- roughly like anywhere from uh, like, I've seen percentages from 50 to about 80%. So I'll say about 70% or 65% hmm. if you average it out of offenders against kids are not maps. Hmm. And they're usually charged getting like teenage girls. So. You know, um, there may be some attraction there because it's teen, they're teenage girls. They're not little kids, right? Right. But in terms of maps, to, st- to in order to um, help with maps, you got to you get you, you need to do what what I'm doing, which is basically like understand what the issue is, um, help maps to first of all try to destigmatize the I'm not saying destigmatize sexual abuse that's a right th- that is rightly stigmatized mm-hmm. and a lot of people will say oh you're trying to make it no I'm not it's yeah. the opposite yeah. of that um, but destigmatizing the sexuality itself will help maps to come out of the, the shadows and to seek help mm-hmm. if you're going okay we're trying to help you we're not trying to um, alienate you you know and and um, a lot of times maps who do offend are ones who are isolated um you know they're they're they feel depressed they feel all these um you know they feel stigmatized you know and they and they become fatalistic you know they get this idea that it doesn't matter i'm gonna you know mess up anyway nobody cares about me and blah 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 and and so that's what happens they you know Hmm. and or in stress major stress is a factor for maps like if you we a lot of times what we find is Maps who um, who have offended uh, were under some kind of severe family stress or stress at work or whatever too. So, helping mm. to mitigate, helping them to mitigate stress, okay. will help. All right. Well, check out Todd's info in the description. Um, let us know what you think about all this in the comments, and I will see you next week.